In the previous sections, we were dealing with static analysis, which is an assumption we made when the load is very slow and the dynamic effects of the system can be ignored. However, in many cases, dynamic effects cannot simply be ignored. It's even the key part of the analysis. Like in the car crash, the drop of a cell phone, or the vibration of a car suspension system. In a dynamic analysis, we will consider the inertia effects of the material and additionally the effects of damping, which we're going to go into detail in our next lessons. In this roller coaster, what is of interest to the engineer could be the forces and resulting stresses on the roller coaster track, as well as those on the car. If the car goes faster, there'll generally be more stress for both the car and the track. Let's take another example. We have a beam with a load on it. Imagine the load is applied slowly to the beam. Here, we can use a static analysis. But if we suddenly drop the load on the beam, or wish to know how that load affects the beam during, say, the shaking of an earthquake, all of these are dynamics problems. So now let's see what's the difference mathematically between a dynamic and a static problem. What extra terms or factors do we need to consider for a dynamics problem? There are three main differences that we need to address. Inertia, damping, and loads that vary with time. But before we get into their details, let's have a look at the equations of motion. What happens if we remove the inertia and the damping and the loads that vary with time? We end up with a simple equation we use in the static analysis that relates the displacements to the forces through the stiffness matrix K. Now the stiffness matrix term can be physically envisioned as a spring. A soft body when pushed upon will deform more than a stiff body, assuming we push with the same applied force. But now getting back to dynamics, let's have a look at inertia. Now from the equations of motion, we see that the first term has the mass matrix. If you ignore all other terms on the left-hand side of the equation, we can see the equation simplifies down to Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. So this mass matrix will include all aspects of the mass and mass distribution of our object. In our roller coaster, if our car is heavier, it will require more force to accelerate it, which is pretty intuitive. Essentially, inertia is the resistance of the body to any change in its velocity. Let's use a cyclist to illustrate this concept. A cyclist is accelerated forward from the pedaling torque, which gets translated into a frictional force at the rear wheel, pushing the bike forward. But aerodynamic drag from the air, or wind drag, and even friction from the rolling resistance of the tires are acting in the opposite direction to the forward motion. For the cyclist to accelerate, the friction force from pedaling must be greater than the sum of the drag and the frictional rolling resistance forces. The sum of these forces will equal the inertia force. The inertia force is sometimes called a fictitious force in the frame of reference of the moving cyclist, and it acts to resist the acceleration of the cyclist. Hence, we show it acting in the opposite direction, or backwards. Likewise, a cyclist that stops pedaling and starts braking is decelerating, and the forces acting are the friction force on the wheels from braking the rolling resistance of the tires, as well as the wind, and now the inertia force acts in the opposite direction, resisting that change in acceleration. Now let's move on to the second difference we need to address. In the equations of motion, let's look at the damping term. For this discussion, we will use this simple spring mass system. If the spring mass system is completely lossless, energy would be conserved, and the mass would oscillate indefinitely. However, in real life, the motion of the spring mass system will eventually stop because damping is generated from the friction between the air and the spring mass system. Also, some of the energy will go into the deformation to the spring and be transformed into small amounts of heat. So damping dissipates energy from a dynamic system. In our equations of motion, we see the damping force is proportional to the velocity. Think of your hand in the water of a swimming pool. Move slowly is easy, but faster requires higher forces. And in our roller coaster example, the wheels are typically made of urethane. Those wheels help absorb or dampen the harsh vibrations of the ride. 
We will cover damping in more detail in a follow-on section. Now the third difference we need to address is the loading variation with time. In a dynamic simulation, how a load varies with time is significant, while in a static analysis, there is no real notion of time. Let's use a simple diving board to illustrate this concept. Both diving boards shown here will have a 50 pound force applied to them, but one will be loaded quickly, while the other is loaded slowly. When we load the board quickly, we get increased deformation, but also notice that the board bounces in the other direction and even comes out of contact with the roller. Interestingly, even the slowly loaded board shows some dynamic behavior as it's loaded as we excite some of the board's natural frequencies. How slow we can load the structure and not induce any dynamic behavior really depends on the structure. When we load slow enough that we see no or little dynamic response, we can call this quasi-static loading. Now in some cases, engineers are only interested in the kinematics or motion of the parts of the system rather than the deformations of the materials. For example, a robot arm or a gear system. Parts can be simplified to rigid bodies instead of continuum bodies. Such dynamics is often called rigid body dynamics. Now clearly in our diving board example, we could not assume the diving board is rigid because it's so flexible. And for it to function, we need the board to bend. But in the case of a robot arm, it is meant to be very stiff so it can be positioned extremely accurately and have limited deformation when forced. In rigid body dynamics, the rigid bodies will not deform to force, so we will instead be looking for quantities such as the position, the motion, the velocity, the acceleration, even the reaction forces between the parts. And each of these has six degrees of freedom, three translations and three rotations per body. The bodies are connected through kinematic joints and even contacts in some cases. So relating this assumption of a rigid body back to our equations of motion, we remove the stiffness term. You can see now we are just left with the mass and damping contributions. We'll continue to explore dynamics in detail in the following sections.